Hi. Good morning, Megan. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm fine, except for I heard some very sad lies. Uh, By whom? I don't know. Somebody who thinks that insects are a really bad idea. What? Yeah. Well, I didn't want to offend you. <laughs> I uh, heard you, Andrew. <laughs> you did? <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, I think it's gross. I'll be honest with you. I think, I think changing our idea about what we eat is just, it, it, it attacks our fundamental fiber. It's like it takes our security. The food is such a fundamental security for us. And it, and it attacks our whole idea of that. I'm just not convinced that we're going to change our, our mindset about this. Well, do you know that 100 years ago, people thought lobster were basically the equivalent of rats? In, in New England, there were so many lobsters littering the shores of, you know, around Boston that they had a law that prisoners were only allowed to eat one lobster per week because this was considered cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> and 40 years ago, do you think we were having Nobu sushi here in <laughs> Budapest? No, I don't think so. Do you think there was sushi in every strip mall around America? No, we changed culture. We took something that we thought was slimy and a little bit creepy and scary, and it became first a delicacy and then sort of a regular everyday part of our diet. So it's evidence that culture can change. And in the case of insects, unlike lobster or sushi, which are fun things to eat, this is actually a world-changing reason to modify our ha habits and behaviors. Right, so what you're saying, like in, this, in, in the instance of eating sushi, we're actually not helping the environment as much as we would be by eating bugs. That's your point? Correct. So insects actually are uh, the most sustainable form of protein that we have on the planet. Um, they are less resource intensive even than plant proteins in a lot of ways. It takes about 250 gallons of water to grow a pound of soybeans and just one gallon of water to grow a pound of crickets. And don't even get me started on beef. Then we're looking at about 2,500 gallons of water for every pound of beef. And that might not matter in a place that rains a lot, but where I live in California, when we have droughts, this is a big deal for farmers. Um, and it's, it's something <coughs> that can save their livelihood to have a drought-resistant crop. But, but isn't it true, though, that we have plenty of other food options that we don't need to eat bugs? I mean, we understand that there's subsidized farming going on. I knew, and I grew up in California as well. I, we heard the stories, I don't know if you know this, but California is a massive dairy producer, and they used to pour 30 or 40 percent of the milk that they would, they would get from cows down the drain to sustain milk prices. They would, they, they would leave food rotting on the vine. Aren't there alternative methods to finding ways to distribute food, preserve food, dry food, store food, not even just conserving it, but just finding ways to get it out there? We are leaving food to rot instead of giving it to people who need it. That is absolutely true, and it's a really good thing that crickets <laughs> eat food waste. So it's actually a brilliant way to close uh, the waste stream. And undoubtedly, uh, eliminating, I, I think it's something like 40% of the food that's grown around the world goes to waste because we have this really strange habit of piling up beautiful stacks of apples and things like that at the grocery store or discarding the ones that aren't beautiful in the first place. But um, you know who eats that? Crickets. So uh, that's a, a way to convert food that would have otherwise been thrown away into useful protein for us. So let me just throw a couple of facts at you here, Andrew. The United Nations put out this huge report uh, in 2013 that said, it came to the conclusion that insects have the ability to stabilize the global food system. Mm. So you and I might not need to eat insects today, but there are about uh, 20 million people um, in, in this summer alone who are at risk of starvation death because of a lack of access to food due to poverty, due to conflict. And um, if, if we could democratize insects, instead of we don't just feed insects to poor people and rich people get to eat meat, that's not fair. If we elevate insects and turn them into ingredients, it, remove the ick factor, turn them into like a powder or, or an oil or something that you can incorporate into the foods you already eat mm. and elevate it as a superfood, then you take away the stigma of poverty. So this is cricket flour. This is um, the, the base ingredient uh, that we use at Biddy Foods in, in our products. And this is actually just 
whole crickets that have been ground into a powder, and the nutrition is incredible. Like, sure, we have other food options, but look at this. It has twice the protein of beef. Yeah, one and a half times the iron of spinach, and it's about 18% healthy fats, the same kind of fats, the omega-3 fatty acids that you would find in salmon or take a, a health supplement to get. And it also has this great fiber that improves the microflora in your digestive system to, to help you thrive and be healthier. So we're definitely seeing a trend, especially in the US, where early adopters, people who are interested in health, interested in sustainability, are not just trying insects, they're seeking them out, especially in the form of you know, incorporated into other foods. Like at, at my company, we make cookies, we make snacks, we make baking flour. And you can basically put this into any food where you would normally have carbohydrates and then infuse it with protein. So these are some of those foods. Um, this is all stuff that I made. I eat bugs multiple times a week in the, <laughs> in the form of baked goods. But doesn't Come on, that look that's good? a corn muffin. No, it's not. It's a cricket muffin with blueberries and a pizza made from cricket flour. Wow. Yeah, so, yeah. I have to say, in this instance, I think you burned this myth for me. I, I do think we do have plenty of other food options, but you're right. It doesn't make a ton of sense to not take the super nutrients of bugs. So I will say that this myth has been burned. But, meat. Yeah, you did, yeah, you did put a number up there. You said twice the protein of beef and things like that. We've been, it, fish, How, I mean, protein, we know the massive resource of protein in fish, beef. Are, are you serious? Are these really the numbers? Little tiny crickets? So, yes, the, the crickets themselves are really rich in protein. They're really delicious. But, you know, I, I, I don't think there's a problem. I personally don't have a problem with people who eat meat. Um, however, do you eat meat? I, I do eat a little bit of meat. Okay. However... One of the reasons that I feel kind of okay about eating a little bit of meat is that it's going away in our lifetime. The global agricultural systems that are used to produce livestock would have to be increased by 70% to feed the next 2 billion people. So you've probably heard the statistics. By 2050, we're going to have somewhere between 9 billion and 11 billion people on this planet. We cannot grow enough meat to feed everyone. And so this is, this is like the protein challenge that is motivating Silicon Valley to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into like stem cell beef or, you know, engineering plant proteins into a fake meat or taking yeast and, and synth using th synthetic biology to make it produce milk proteins. We have an existing biomass of protein all around us that's eaten by two billion people around the world already, and that's insects, and they're right here. And all we have to do is harvest the protein and incorporate it into the foods we already eat, and it's gonna make a huge difference. Yeah, but even what, in what you said, there are agencies, organizations trying to create kind of doppelganger or ersatz meat products and put protein in them because we're so fixated on what we want. We're, we're, we're actually willing to make props and costumed food so that people keep their mentality just right. How can you compete with that psychology? I'm not trying to. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, there's a place for these alternative proteins in our future. I think the, the, the plate of the future is going to look really different. Basically, when supply and demand shifts so mm. that uh, the demand for meats far outstrips the supply, mm. Meat is going to be very, very expensive. Economists say that in our lifetime, beef could be priced like caviar. So you're not going to have a big steak very often. You're, you're going to have bacon bits maybe, you know, like maybe a steak every now and then if you're wealthy. A lot of people on this planet will not have access to meat. So sure, okay, we'll eat the stem cell burger or whatever, but there's a really good chance that we're going to need to fortify the rest of the foods on our plate with protein. So you can imagine a pasta that is, is fortified with protein. And so instead of getting a big plate full of carbs, you get a balanced meal. Uh, and, that, and that's the sort of things that we're creating. Nice. Yeah. So, you know, look at this. A third of the Earth's land mass is used to produce livestock and the, and the food that livestock eats. Um, we, don't, we just don't have any more land to grow the meat or to grow the feed that they eat. And instead, we've got to figure out ways to take back some of that land and, uh, you know, use it for all these people that are going to be here as well. Here's our uh, caviar statistic. It's crazy.
crazy, mm. right? All right. I am, I'm sad. I'm going to be reduced to bacon bits. <laughs> I have to say, it's bad news for me because I love cooking and eating and I love meat, but I agree. The myth is burned. <laughs> However, this is the tough one, and it's what I alluded to earlier. Bugs are gross. Face it, they're, they're unhygienic. You don't know where they've been. Yeah, they, they're totally unpredictable in their behavior where they, they carry disease, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, it's just, it's not what people want. And like you said, the, the ick factor. It's like, do I want to imagine? We, they put memorable scenes in movies, right, where there's a, some bug leg hanging out of someone's mouth. Or they're doing these things that will never exit your mind, these images that they've burned into you, thing like, oh, horrifying. You eat one. Let me ask you a question. How do you feel about prawns? I love them. Right? How do you I, feel about crabs? I know what they call them bugs. I know that's like the fishermen themselves say. They're cousins. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> they're all arthropods. They, yeah. They're in the same family. Those are just bugs in the sea. And we're talking about bugs on the earth. Yeah, and also, Andrew, look at that. Does that look disgusting to you? I think it looks delicious. You know where it came from? Noma. <laughs> really? <laughs> Noma, the number one restaurant in the world. Recently dethroned by uh, a New York restaurant, but that's okay. Um, they serve insects. In fact, the Danish government gave uh, Nordic Food Lab about a million dollars to explore the gastronomic possibilities of insects because in, in my company, we use crickets because crickets, they basically sort of taste like nuts. Like, mm -hmm. they're very neutral. They're not an exciting bug. Basically, crickets just take on the flavor of whatever you put on them. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to make them delicious. But right. there are other bugs, like ants. There are ants that can taste like lemon. There are ants that can taste like vinegar. There are, there are certain worms, like wax worms. They use it, uh, Noma, and they, they make like this beautiful texture for like a, a, a mousse or something. There's like all of these interesting culinary applications. So I would argue that some of the world's best chefs are using insects, and they're not gross. They're amazing. And also, about the hygiene thing, yeah, okay, we're not eating mosquitoes. Mosquitoes transmit disease. There are flies, flies transmit disease. Yes, of course, but that's like saying that all of the animals that have four legs are equivalent. Like, there's 2,000 species of insects that humans eat, and there's tens of thousands of species that we don't eat, right? I mean, you don't just like, I don't know. There are lots of four-legged animals well, you don't they, eat. They, true that. I mean, they, they, we're not going up and eating mountain goats all that often, I yeah. suppose, where some, some cultures obviously do, you know. But, but the, maybe my point might be a bit fortified by this. The euphemistic approach to discussing meat and food has always been kind of fascinating to me. Uh, we use words like poultry, right, in Hungarian. And in, 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 in fact, if I've checked this across the board. In most languages... I have found this to be true. In, in Hungarian, they say baromfi. They don't say, they do say you're eating chicken, but they don't necessarily say, they say, uh, they don't say disnot esel. We don't say you're eating pig. We say you're eating pork. We don't say that you're eating uh, a tiny baby cow. We say that you're eating veal. We, uh, so we've euphemized these things already. Even meat had to be euphemized mm -hmm. because most people don't want to go out there and say, oh, you are eating a small sheep. They're like, you're eating lamb, you right. know, or whatever it is. And so th this, to me, faces even a greater challenge because this, how do you euphemize this? Okay, so first of all, we don't euphemize duck or crab or lobster. There are plenty of animals. Because that we, these are elegant, right? right? But, but there's a professor <laughs> at, what? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I think that that's it. I think their reputation has become that's elegant. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah okay. because they've got the same, because like I've spent time with, with lobster fishermen from Ireland or from Maine, and they do locally call them bugs. They don't say lobsters, right? Because right. they, they call them bugs. And that's that. I remember hearing that, and I love lobster, and I was like, oh, come on, don't call them bugs. But they do call them bugs, and they don't <laughs> euphemize them, right, right? right? And I think if we called lobsters bugs, if you sit, went into one of those great restaurants in New York where they steam you a lobster, and they're like, all right, guys, it's $26 a pound for your bug, I'm not sure people would be that excited to buy them. Well, I don't know. There's been a, there, there's a professor um, at the University of Pennsylvania in the U.S., which is an Ivy League university, and he's this uh, psychologist who has 
become known as Dr. Disgust. Um, and he, he actually studies disgust reactions among people. And he did this experiment where um, he gave people ice cream. He asked people, would you eat ice cream that's been touched by a cockroach? And everybody said, no, absolutely not. That's disgusting. And he was like, OK, so what's disgusting about it? Well, cockroaches are dirty. And he said, OK, I will sterilize the cockroach, then touch the ice cream. Now what do you think? And they're like, no. Like, just the, the cockroach carries the stigma, right? right. And so <laughs> he, he also argues that um, there is this, uh, this disgust reaction around all meat. Like, hence our, our need to euphemize. There's only a few species of four-legged animals that we eat regularly, and there's only certain parts of those animals that we eat, and we have to hide their names, right? Yeah. So we're, we're saying cricket flour, and right now at this early stage in the game, people don't even, I can't tell you how many people say to me, what do you mean when you say cricket? Like, they think I'm talking about, like, quinoa or something. Like, it's a, a weird name for, like, an ancient grain. So I haven't found the need to... They want to, you to euphemize yeah, it. Yeah, like, I haven't found the need to change the name because people don't understand that I could possibly be talking about actual insects anyway. Um, so, yeah. I, That's my point. Yeah, yeah. But, but the thing is, it's like what we're doing to euphemize, quote-unquote, is to remove the ick factor by removing any like visual, textural, or taste association with the creepy crawly mm -hmm. thing. Like ev everything that you taste that comes out of our kitchen, it's gonna either be like down to the form of a powder, like a baking flour that you can use to make your own creations, or it's going to be designed by chefs, or like put into something delicious and, and sold to you ready-made in a way that you'll never, you'll know that there's bugs because we don't lie to you. It's in the branding, it's in the packaging design, but, uh, yeah, you'd never know from the flavor. I have to say, to be honest with you, I've eaten crickets. I've spent time in Mexico and eaten them. You tricked eaten me. Them. I did trick you. <laughs> I don't find them disgusting, but I do think people will. But I have to say, this myth has been bust. We are going to have to. There it is. So I want to know. I want to know. <laughs> you burned all the myths. You've done it. But I, I want to know now, is anybody more curious about, uh, God, there's so much smoke. I know. We're Whee! steaming some crickets yeah. here. Does anybody, who's curious about eating insects now? Anybody? A few people? All right. Wow. Does anybody backstage have any bugs? Anybody? Yeah. Can, can someone bring us some bugs? All right. <laughs> Let's toss those out <laughs> yes. into the crowd. Let's do that. OK, ready? I can't see you through the smoke, so don't, so don't get Hands in up. <laughs> Yay, please share them with your friends. <laughs> so fun. A big hand for Megan Miller.